Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Laramie County Extension Gardening for Success program. And tonight's guest speaker is Scott Shell, and Scott is a grasshopper expert and <laughs> probably on a national level. So I'm very pleased to have him as our speaker tonight. And if you've got a question as we go along, you can either you know raise your hand on the, the Zoom program or enter a question in the chat or just um, go ahead and, and jump in. And if you put a question into chat, I will interrupt Scott at an appropriate moment and ask him a question. So with that, I'm going to turn everything over to Scott Shell, who um, also, by the way, teaches insects for the Master Gardener program, which is always very fun and entertaining. So I will turn everything over to Scott so he can teach us all about grasshoppers and how to deal with them. Well, uh, thank you, Catherine, for having me uh, on tonight to speak about grasshoppers. Um, I have a fondness for them. I don't think most people do, but I, I wanted to start off initially. Uh, let's see, I guess I will have to share my screen and get that going. So I'll go there and share. Can everybody see the jumping antelope? Yep, right. I can. <laughs> well, what, what I want to share is that uh, you probably heard in the news about the uh, desert locust outbreak that uh, is uh, huge now. And actually, um, my old uh, boss and friend, Alex Slashninski, uh, he now works for the uh, uh, United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization and uh, is involved with the uh, locust control, and, but last summer he sent me a picture from a, a movie from Pakistan. So if you think you got grasshoppers bad, it, it's like typically there's always somebody worse off. So let's see if we can get that to play. So you can see here the ground's moving. I don't know if there was anything for the the desert locust to eat. Uh, but uh, that's why they're marching, is they're trying to find something to eat. Uh, these are nymphs, a late star nymphs, later in the development, but they're wingless, or, or, uh, so they can't fly. But I thought that I started off the bat just so you know, think, well, maybe my grasshoppers are not that bad. So then we'll go go in here and see if that, whoops, I need to get the right button hit. There we go. So yeah, sometimes you might feel like your garden is an island in a sea of grasshoppers. And in, in many ways, it's a kind of a good analogy because uh, uh, it can be very difficult to control grasshoppers or manage them uh, if you don't have a way to stop them at their source. And I'll explain more as we go along. <clears throat> so uh, just standard product disclaimer, if I talk about them, it's not an endorsement. <clears throat> and so your garden may look similar to uh, a friend of mine's raspberry patch uh, last summer uh, where he had just a few grasshoppers in there. Uh, they didn't seem to be eating on the leaves uh, quite so bad, but as the, the berries ripened, they would munch on those. So that's uh, not too many people eat the raspberry leaves, but certainly everybody likes the raspberries. So they can be a real problem in, in uh, areas like that. <clears throat> Let's see if I can get to advance. What's going on here? I'm having a problem with my computer here. There we go. It finally responded. So um, now we, we lump them all together. We call them grasshoppers, but there's actually over 100 species, uh, probably close to 125 in Wyoming. Uh, uh, that, uh, you know, the vast majority of them are harmless, or uh, in some cases, they can even be beneficial if they eat 
noxious weeds is their primary diet. But we have about a dozen species that can be pests, and of those, uh, uh, four are the primary ones. And then, of course, I'd say in Wyoming, the two-striped grasshopper is a, a frequent and major pest in gardens and, and in cropping situations. You can see here, this is an adult male two-striped grasshopper. The two stripes refer to these lines running down its back. Now, they're, they're, they're fairly large, and uh, they all have this black on the top half of their femur. So if you get a good close look at them, but the other members of that genus that are problematic are the migratory and then the differential. Uh, sometimes the differential will be jet black and they have uh, yellow chevrons, but uh, most of the time it'll be all yellow with more defined black chevrons on its femur. There's the two-striped and then the red-legged uh, <coughs> is, is one that can be a problem usually farther east, but uh, sometimes can be a problem. This is really when we want to be looking for them is when they're immature, or the, the, the nymphal stage, uh, immature grasshoppers. And so they look quite a bit different and they're wingless. And, and this is what they look like when they hatch from the eggs in the ground early in the spring. Uh, you know, we have some grasshoppers that actually overwinter as nymphs and will become adults real early in the spring. And you'll see them flying around and, and about the time when you see them, uh, they often have uh, colored underwings, either red or yellow, is when uh, these can start to hatch. And so uh, uh, these particular ones, usually uh, uh, May, uh, it kind of depends on the year. They're timed to uh, coincide with the maximum growth of vegetation. Uh, and, and so that's when they hatch. They have an extended hatching period. Uh, all four of these species uh, probably 52 days from start to finish. And so that makes it problematic. You can't just go out and say, well, I treated grasshoppers on the third week in May and I won't have a problem because you have a uh, hatch going on continually through that time period. And, and so that, that uh, definitely makes it more difficult. It's not like you can go out and say, oh, they're all, all out. I can treat them now and, and, and not have to worry about them. Uh, so uh, many uh, products, especially the biological ones, uh, you, you need to have a, a continued exposure to these as they hatch. And so um, I also, uh, one way you can differentiate some of these from other non-pest species is that I, I call it the Nike swoosh. They all kind of have, you can really see it on the red-legged one there, that white bar uh, kind of goes back on them. <clears throat> But uh, again, uh, when they hatch out, they're about the size of long grain rice. And so that's uh, a lot of times people don't realize they've got them until they get bigger. And uh, they can also vary in color. Uh, the two-striped grasshopper can be light green, almost lime green to brown. It always has that black on the femur. Uh, the two-striped uh, peak hatch, it's probably uh, anywhere from May 15th to June 15th. Kind of depends on where you're at in the state and what kind of spring we're having. Uh, <clears throat> it eats many types of plants. Uh, it prefers forbs. It really likes legumes too. Uh, it is prolific. A single egg pod that the female produces. Uh, each uh, uh, one will hold anywhere from 50 to 100 eggs. And they will produce egg pods until a hard killing frost in the fall. Uh, it, unless something else kills them first. Uh, usually it depends on the nutrition, but uh, once they get going, they can usually uh, produce an egg pod about every seven to 10 days. So they can produce a lot of offspring. Uh, the adults of these are capable of flight and short migrations, and, and they frequently do that. Uh, you'll see it uh, about this time of year, especially in a dry year when they've eaten down uh, the vegetation where they come from, uh, a lot of times like roadsides where you've got um, uh, sweet clover or uh, you know, the areas around buildings uh, and, and vacant alleys and vacant, uh, or vacant lots and, and alleyways where you've got ragweed and kochia, those types of things. And once that gets eaten down, they'll start moving into what's still green, which is usually people's yards and gardens. Uh, to go from when they hatch to adult is about 40 days in hot weather. Um, it's, it's 
just, you know, if the grasshoppers just ate, uh, uh, it wouldn't be quite as bad. Although, uh, you know, we think of them, oh, they're small, that's pretty insignificant, but they eat their body weight daily in green vegetation. And that's a much higher percentage than you know, an animal like a uh, sheep or a cow eats. And, and then the, they're, they add up because they can be so numerous. And so at um, a, a relatively low density of 30 per yard, per square yard, that's how we estimate them is in per square yard, of the two-stripe grasshopper, half male, half female, and the males are smaller than the females. Uh, uh, the average female weighs about 1.1 grams in adult. That's 200 pounds of grasshoppers per acre. And so that's like having a sheep on every acre of your land that could eat its body weight daily. Uh, most of the rangeland grasshoppers that can be rangeland pests are smaller. And so like the migratory grasshopper is more about the size of the clear wing. But they can reach much higher densities than just 30 per square yard. And then, they, so they eat a lot, but the, the way they eat uh, is, is also um, very uh, wasteful because they can cut off leaves, eat what they want, and they'll drop. And, and it's been uh, demonstrated that 10 adult two-stripe grasshoppers per square yard can de defoliate a knee-high corn crop. That's uh, uh, the size of the corn crop there. You know, it would be, you know, if there's an Iowa corn crop that was 13 feet tall, that wouldn't do it. But early on, that's uh, all it takes to defoliate a corn crop. So grasshoppers, they, uh, uh, have a, a life cycle, an annual life cycle. Some of them, like say, they'll hatch at different times and, and be out of the ground. Uh, the primary ones that are pests, uh, they overwinter as an egg pod in the ground, and then they'll hatch and go through these stages or nymphal instars, uh, anywhere from seven to 10 days, uh, to, and they have to molt in order to, to grow in between stages because they have a hard exoskeleton. And they generally do that hanging upside down on vegetation. They do it someplace very secretive. Uh, I know a lot of people have lived all their lives in areas where there's a lot of grasshoppers and they've never seen one molt. Uh, but and they're very vulnerable because they, when they first come out of that old exoskeleton, they're very soft. They can't hop or fly. Uh, and, and so they, they want to avoid that. Uh, now this is uh, uh, showing ones like the migratory grasshopper or those those desert locusts that can fly. Uh, many times the uh, grasshopper only goes as far as it needs to to find what, it, what it's looking for, like food. And, and so it, if it can find everything it needs, uh, all the nutrition it needs right where it hatched, that's where it'll stay. But if it has to move, it will. Uh, generally after they become adults, they get their full length wings. There are some species that are short wing, but our pest species get wings that are functional. And uh, then the females usually uh, need to mature uh, sexually uh, another 10 days before they produce their first uh, egg pod. And then they mate and then they deposit it in the ground. And, and uh, uh, like I said, they can keep doing that till you have a hard frost. <clears throat> so you can have a, a, a lot of grasshoppers produced. Uh, many times the difference between having an outbreak year and a non-outbreak year can be conditions when they first hatch out of the ground. So uh, in some cases, if you get a severe weather event that coincides with the peak hatch, then you won't have a problem. Uh, but in other cases, you know, like uh, if you've had a lot of grasshoppers and they produced a lot of eggs in the ground, like in 2019, even if we had terrible conditions in, in 2020 for their hatch, and you got, you know, 15% survival. If there's, you know, lots and lots of eggs, you're still going to have a problem. <clears throat> so grasshoppers have lots of natural enemies, you know, things uh, we, we might not even think of, things like uh, rodents, 13 uh, lining ground squirrels, the grasshopper uh, mouse, uh, uh, birds, uh, mountain bluebirds depend on the grasshoppers uh, to feed their uh, uh, nestlings, uh, in mountain bluebirds, they come back early and, and they'll feed, you'll see them perching on fences and dropping down and they're primarily insectivores. And what they're going for are, are like the uh, grasshoppers that overwinter as nymphs, and so um, you know, beneficial. And then uh, toads, uh, uh, other amphibians uh, uh, and, and lizards, those types of things. <clears throat> 
many insects and spiders. You can think of grasshoppers as kind of being like the insect buffalo because, you know, in grasslands, they're year in and year out, they're the primary consumer of, of grass uh, forage on grasslands. And so many insects uh, will prey on them. Uh, things like robber flies and, and uh, carabid or brown beetles, tiger beetles, and the, there's also insects that can use them to feed or provision their young. And, and by that, I mean um, uh, things like the uh, tachinid flies or, or sarcophagid flies, they can lay their eggs on it. The eggs will hatch, the larva will bore into the grasshoppers uh, and feed on them internally. And then you have others like uh, hunting wasps that can uh, capture a grasshopper, uh, sting it and paralyze it, leave it alive, drag it back to a hole in the ground that's dug and lay an egg on it. And that, uh, by not killing it, it keeps that meat fresh for the larva. When they hatch out, they have a, a fresh meal to eat. So you also have uh, insects that are specialized in finding and eating grasshopper egg pots and uh, things like the bee flies. Uh, so they, they uh, as adults, they feed on pollen uh, or nectar primarily. Um, and then what they do is uh, will search out areas where grasshoppers laying eggs and lay their own eggs. And uh, the maggots are able to bore down into uh, through the egg pod mass and get in there and then we'll eat the eggs uh, and <clears throat> develop. Same way with blister beetles. Uh, not all blister beetles do that. Some of them go after things like the ground nesting bees, but uh, uh, there's uh, the black blister beetle and a couple of the gray ones in Wyoming that are uh, uh, egg predators. Uh, they lay eggs and uh, eggs hatch and they have mobile larvae that search out grasshopper egg pods. And so uh, those types of things. That's all of those things help as uh, uh, natural controls, but uh, you know, essentially uh, <clears throat> sometimes it's not enough. Um, there's also fungal diseases and bacterial diseases and viruses that affect grasshoppers. Uh, sometimes you'll see, uh, usually in Wyoming, it's along uh, creeks, you'll see grasshoppers that are, are dead and they're clinging to the tops of vegetation, and that's caused by a fungal disease that. Uh, it's called summit disease is the common name for it, Entomophaga grilli. <clears throat> and uh, it's interesting because, you know, the grasshoppers go up there and die in that position and then the fungi uh, sporulates and, and this helps actually spread the, the spores in the environment. But uh, like say, sometimes uh, natural con controls fail. This is an example of predator saturation or an outbreak uh, near LaGrange, Wyoming that I took a picture of. So these are uh, 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 Melanopus uh, nymphs. Uh, perfect food for this big wolf spider, but it's like I can't eat anymore. <clears throat> I'm full. Uh, so uh, you know, definitely uh, it, it, it doesn't always uh, work to keep them suppressed. <laughs> Uh, one of the things about grasshoppers in gardens and, and yards and towns uh, and suburbs and stuff like that is any place that's tilled uh, doesn't produce grasshopper eggs because if they laid their eggs in that, it, you know, the mechanical tillage will destroy them. So they, the females uh, like uh, the loose uh, dirt of roadsides that is disturbed and has a, a, you know, a lot of uh, vegetation and also weedy uh, patches uh, around vacant lots and, and those types of things, uh, alleyways, can produce a lot of grasshopper eggs. So uh, identifying those helps you to uh, manage them if you can uh, do management to that area. <clears throat> uh, you know, these areas that they like to put their egg pods in can have extremely high numbers. The differential grasshopper, which is bigger than the two-stripe, uh, in egg uh, production studies, they found anywhere from 45 to 194 eggs. Very precise, 194. I'm sure there was a grad student counting each one of those eggs in their pods. But. So if you had a density of 40 of those per square yard and 20 females, and each female only produced one average egg pod, that would be 900 eggs per square yard. So very high density. <clears throat> How do you treat small areas? Well, uh, you know, in, in ag 
production, uh, there is ways, you know, you have things from spray planes, to spray buggies, to like APVs where you can be set up to uh, apply uh, insecticides to you know, relatively small areas like roadsides and stuff like that. Uh, in gardens, uh, smaller areas, you know, you're probably going to look at hand sprays or uh, hand applicators. Uh, and what are the options for treating those areas? Well, as far as organic products, uh, uh, one of the things that is available that is or has organic certification is uh, a, a, a disease organism called uh, Paris nosinima locusta. It used to be, and I think it's still probably uh, more widely known as nosema locusta, but it's been reclassified. Uh, it's a type of fungi, uh, and in it's the active ingredient in semispore and norobate. Uh, the problem with this particular one, it's been around a long time and it was tested extensively, is uh, <clears throat> it has to be grown in vivo. And so that means to produce this, they have to have a huge colony of grasshoppers in captivity and then infect some of them and get, that's how they generate the spores. So, so there are some of the biological control organisms that you know, they'll kill an insect, but then they, it's versatile enough that they can grow it on media like rice or, or something like that, and then harvest the spores. Uh, Metaresium and uh, Bavaria uh, are two of those. Uh, <clears throat> and unfortunately, this one isn't. And there is another uh, uh, species within the Paranosema that is highly virulent and kills grasshoppers effectively, but it kills them so fast they can't produce it in colony. Essentially, it, it, uh, so uh, like I say, this is always uh, going to be a, a issue with uh, this particular product. It has a fairly short shelf life. It's recommended to be stored at like 42 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, once it's applied to the wheat bran uh, that it's sold on as a bait uh, carrier, uh, about eight to 13 weeks, say, on the shelf. And, uh, According to the label of the product, uh, it can be repeated treatments about every four to six weeks. Like I said, our grasshoppers have an extended hatching period, and so it would violate the label to apply it uh, within the length of time that it's actually uh, you know, efficacious and or uh, you know, the, the brand doesn't get blown away or washed away by rain and those types of things. So you, you can't really apply it on a weekly basis. And, and, and it really is most effective applied so the little grasshoppers when they hatch out of the egg would pick it up. <clears throat> but it is commercially available. Last year they had a heck of a problem. I think the one place had a, uh, the one outfit had a fire and then the other one, uh, I think it was being put up for sale. And, and so I think this year they did produce, uh, but uh, the, some of the uh, mail order outfits that I checked we're already out of stock. So it's kind of seasonal. Like I said, they have to actually grow it in grasshoppers. And, and so that's, uh, and it has a, um, a short shelf life. So uh, it can be a problem. So, and then the efficacy, uh, especially if it's applied to late in star or adult grasshoppers, uh, I would classify it as suppression not control. Other organic products that are available, uh, is a directin, and this is an interesting one. Um, it is derived from neem trees, and uh, it uh, is an antifeedant that the neem trees contain. Neem trees are famous because they are uh, native to Southwest Asia in areas which are subject to desert locusts uh, and, and migratory locust uh, plagues. And that's one plant that, that they will not, uh, you know, uh, eat all the leaves off of because it, uh, the leaves contain vacuoles with azadiractin and other chemicals in it that uh, is uh, a repellent. Uh, and, and so uh, that one uh, can be uh, uh, products that are sold. You know, there's quite a few of them that have that in it uh, uh, that can repel and or kill uh, little grasshoppers if they eat it. Uh, pyrethrins, which are the naturally derived uh, compounds from chrysanthemum flowers. Uh, there are products that contain those. Uh, they uh, have a quick knockdown. You have to watch out. They are broad spectrum, so you, know, you, you want to be careful with those. Uh, 
uh, you know, don't apply it to blooming uh, uh, plants. Road cutters, it's a physical uh, control method. Uh, I know in Wyoming, you know, our windy weather, I think was gusting to 39. Uh, 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 that was before the thunderstorm here in Laramie uh, today. Uh, that can be problematic. Uh, but row covers, a physical barrier can protect plants and, and be, you know, utilized from year to year. Uh, poultry, uh, you, you got to watch out uh, chickens because uh, they're omnivores and they can sometimes get carried away and, and eat things that they shouldn't. Um, when I was a kid, they had uh, ruins, which are kind of a duck, and they were highly effective uh, grasshopper getters. Uh, turkeys, uh, guinea fowl, those types of things. If you if you want to have them as part of your management program and, and utilize them, that uh, is fine. You can get. Uh, uh, they, I do know that uh, like duck eggs uh, on ducks that have been eating a lot of grasshoppers are really super rich. <clears throat> uh, plant management. We control in your grasshopper egg areas in those uh, areas if you can control around your farmstead or your your. Uh, your vacant lot next to you or your alleyways. Uh, so there, you don't have plenty of the, that weeds for when those little grasshoppers start to hatch. You know, number one, they're more exposed to predation and weather events and they don't have nutritious feed. So weed control in those grasshopper egg producing areas or, or uh, egg laying areas are, is critical. <clears throat> the conventional products, uh, carbaryl has been around since 1958. It's the active ingredient in, in the product that was called Seven. Now Seven, the trademark brand name has been sold and it no longer uses carbaryl, it uses a pyrethroid, but uh, it's kind of, they substituted something that has broad labeling. Uh, bait uh, made from various substrates, whether it's uh, apple pumice like Wilbur LSLs or carbaryl or uh, wheat bran like uh, Eco Brand. Uh, uh, the, they're good for grasshoppers. They are fairly targeting and it reduces the amount of pesticide needed. And that always reduces hazard. You know, you reduce, uh, you, you want to reduce hazard, uh, you pick a least toxic insecticide and apply the least amount of it that you can get away with and still get a uh, result. And so <clears throat> certainly uh, uh, they can be effective. Uh, not all grasshoppers are bait takers, but uh, are the four main crop species that, uh, uh, like the two stripe, the differential, uh, migratory, and red legged, are bait takers. <clears throat> you want to treat early and often where they hatch. You know, get them before they cause the problem. Light sprinkles with good coverage uh, is, is more effective than big piles here and there. You know, you, and, and, like I say, it weathers away, and then uh, other grasshoppers eat it. And, and then you have more grasshoppers hatch, you're gonna to have to retreat. You can't just do a one and done with this particular product. <clears throat> uh, other you know, conventional products applied as a spray uh, would be carbaryl. Uh, again, uh, they sell that as a, a form you can apply as a liquid. It has really broad labeling uh, on a lot of different things, but you always wanna read labels because with the garden, you know, you, you've got things from, you know, you may not be eating the leaves on your uh, uh, turnips, uh, you know, you're going to just eat the, the root, uh, but it's different if you're applying something to, you know, what you're going to eat as table greens. And, and so uh, you, you want to make sure that the product has got the crop that you're treating and you want to obey uh, the pre-harvest interval, that's what PHI stands for. So uh, you want to make sure then that the, the pesticide is uh, essentially the residue is uh, declined to the point where it's safe to eat by following the pre-harvest interval. You don't want to apply it when pollinators are active uh, at, in your garden. Uh, uh, you, you can do that, you know, like avoid the times when uh, things like honeybees are, are actively uh, foraging. They do it in, the, in primarily in the daytime, be gone to dusk. And so you can do your applications after they've gone to bed. Uh, and again, you know, you want to try to treat those source habitats outside the garden, you know, because then it, it's like you're, you're not uh, utilizing the pesticide on your crop. You're, you're doing it more targeted. Uh, and, and think about that for next spring. You want to put it on your calendar to start looking for these spots where they're hatching, where these little grasshoppers are coming out of the ground next spring. And that's where you're going to concentrate your management efforts. 
how about protecting your garden plants with a repellent? Because really, you know, uh, at least to me, I wouldn't mind grasshoppers hopping around if they weren't chewing on my plants. Um, and we, so we tried to uh, uh, test some of the things that are either sold as a insect repellent uh, plant protectants or uh, thought, well, we'll give it a shot. Things like uh, uh, Deer Garden, which has Vitrex, which is supposed to be the most bitter substance known to man. It didn't claim insects, just claims deer and mammals. And I will testify that it is extremely bitter because I just got the little spray drift back and, and got some in my mouth one time. And, Ooh, that fuckers you up. <clears throat> uh, stuff like garlic barrier, hot pepper wax. Uh, the grasshoppers that I tested, they like their food hot and spicy, so it didn't work. Uh, piney, it's a type of terpene that's uh, in, in pine trees. Uh, uh, and you know, terpenes are generally plant protectants that they produce, things like sagebrush. They're not all insects uh, capable of eating uh, a plant that has uh, uh, potent terpenes, and that's usually stuff that you can really smell. Um, no grasshoppers will eat it, and, and probably anybody who's ever had grasshoppers really bad know that they will chew on pine trees and spruce trees uh, when they run out of everything else in Ropal, uh, which has got thymol. We thought that might work, but it didn't. The only thing that worked as a repellent was uh, isodractin. And uh, it worked fine in the lab. Uh, when we took it to the field, it, it was very short acting. And, and what it turns out is when azadiractin is in a neem tree, it's contained in little vacuoles, I think is the proper term, in the leaves. So a locust or a grasshopper comes up and bites that leaf, it releases that, and it's like, ooh, I'm not gonna eat that. Whereas when you extract it and you spray it on a plant, it immediately it's exposed to UV and more oxygen and it starts to break down. So the problem with the product was short, period of time where it was effective as a repellent to keep them from eating and stuff. But again, uh, uh, kind of interesting, there's, uh, we didn't find anybody that was really interested in pursuing it, but uh, micro encapsulation, where they take the active ingredient and put it in a little capsule and then apply it to a plant, perhaps uh, uh, there is that technology. There's some of the insecticides that are applied that way. but. Uh, Again, uh, the azadiractin is uh, the only thing that we found that would work. Um, so insufficient data to recommend any compound really is a reliable repellent of grasshoppers. Uh, but the biological activity of that uh, azadiractin was very low. So uh, it would require repeated uh, applications through the season. And uh, there are some of the products out there that they're labeling as such at least at the time when I looked this one up, Azamax, it said spray at an interval of seven to 10 days or as the situation warrants. So if you have something that's of high value to you, uh, a prize ornamental or you know something, uh, I wouldn't waste a lot of money on my radish patch, but if you're, you're protecting something that's really of value to you, uh, then this might be a product that, uh, you know, if you're getting hammered by grasshoppers, it might be worth investigating. <clears throat> So, any grasshopper questions there? I, I'm trying to keep it relatively short so we still have some evening time to go out and water things and see what the wind blew off and stuff like that this evening. Is there any questions, Catherine? I um, you must have explained this beautifully because I'm not seeing any questions. I, I do have a question for you though, Scott. Um, aren't there some actually good grasshoppers, grasshoppers that are beneficial? Yeah, I, I, I mentioned that there's a couple of them that will eat uh, weeds. They help suppress weed populations, things like the uh, snakeweed grasshopper. Uh, it, it, it is, uh, what's the term is oligophagus. It, so it eats uh, a few different plants, but they're all in the Guderizia snakeweed family. And snakeweed's considered a noxious plant because 
um, you know, our livestock won't eat it and it's an increaser. So in the grazing pressure, you know, it's not being eaten and your, your good forage plants are being eaten and so it's increasing. Uh, there are, uh, uh, the cudweed grasshopper would be another one that helps, you know, just prevents uh, things. There is another grasshopper, it's related to the crop pests. It's a, a Melanopsis occidentalis. And uh, when cactus are blooming, it has uh, an affinity for eating the reproductive parts out of cactus blossoms. So it probably does help uh, uh, re reduce the uh, prickly pear cactus spread by uh, uh, preventing seed production. So there are a few grasshoppers. And of course, like I said, their, their role in the ecosystem is invaluable. That's why you know, we, we want to be careful uh, to manage them when they're a pest but otherwise not, uh, you know, we don't want to wipe them out. That's good to know that there are actually some good guys out there in the grasshopper world and not all of them are bad. And I've had to deal with grasshopper infestations in the past and I used the NOLO bait and that knocked them back by about 50% and then I brought in chickens and they took care of the rest in about 24 hours. So it was very efficacious on the chickens part. Yeah, the, the, you know, the NOLO or um, uh, like, so we, we tested things like the Metaresium. Uh, there's a product called F52 that uh, had some labeling for other pests uh, uh, and, and Bulbaria bassiana. We could get good infection, but we, we couldn't kill them because it, it's interesting. Uh, we think of uh, insects as being cold-blooded, but what they do is uh, they're able to uh, manipulate their body temperature in the environment uh, to uh, the ideal point. And when we would infect them uh, with these uh, pathogens, uh, they do like what our body does. We get a fever. And so they would do a behavioral fever. They would expose more of their body to the sunshine, raise their body a temperature up to the point where it would stop the infection but it, you know it, it, it's one of those things you know like say the the nolo bait uh, uh, would uh, kind of make those grasshoppers feel off their game and probably made it pretty easy for the chickens to pick them off uh, i know uh, when my ducks uh, when i was a kid they they utilized a lot of calories just chasing down grasshoppers uh, so certainly that uh, good combination there Oh, excellent. So, so there is a lot of options and choices for controlling grasshoppers and mitigating some of the devastation that they can cause. I know that when I walk through certain areas that I haven't weeded, the grasshoppers just are all over the place. And, and you're certainly right about the kochia and they got a little bit of pigweed. And so they're just, they're loving those little areas. Yeah, it's, it, it, it really can be important to do some weed control where you can because uh, uh, it provides them with shelter from other predators uh, and it's food for them. And, and so by uh, identifying those areas uh, and, and controlling that, it will also make it easier to treat. Because one of the things too, you know, if you treat those areas, uh, broadleaf plants, you treat the, uh, them and then new growth will come up that's untreated and grasshoppers like to go up and perch on top and that's where they'll be eating. And, and so, uh, yeah, definitely uh, it, it, it's a multi-pronged approach. It's integrated pest management and you look at things you can do to reduce their reproductive success and, and, and control them, especially you know, it's really best to always control your grasshoppers outside of your garden or outside of your crop. Uh, that's the best. So does anyone have any questions for Scott on grasshoppers, grasshopper control? Yeah, Scott, this is Leroy. You might mention the nematode. We sent the pictures, the one with the worms out of the grasshoppers. That was kind of a um, an eye opener, I guess you would say. Yeah, there's a uh, uh, first hair nematode. Uh, let me see here, uh, escape out of this. I don't know if I can find a relatively quick one. Uh, uh, horsehair nematode is another uh, parasite of grasshoppers and crickets. Um, it's another one that kind of manipulates its victim. Uh, 
because their life cycle, the, the, the horse hair nematode's life cycle requires uh, the, the uh, stage to occur in water. And so the grasshopper or cricket ends up jumping into like a mud puddle and, and then the horsehair worm will uh, come out. Let's see if I can get a picture of it. <clears throat> yeah, so, so you can see here that, that they attack other insects besides grasshoppers, but uh, again, it's quite amazing how long of a nematode can uh, come out of uh, a grasshopper. So uh, again, um, and also crickets or drusling crickets, those types of things can have these things. And, and like I say, they manipulate it to get it in the water because that's the next stage where the horsehair worm to reproduce, they need to, to be in the water. It looks like that horsehair worm is not very selective on what insects it goes after. Yeah, it's well, I think there's species within. Uh, I, I, I'm glad I don't have to try to uh, a species horsehair worm because that knows out what you have to look at. Uh, but it's, um, uh, yeah, there's definitely probably a lot of different species. It's probably kind of like uh, round worms in livestock. You know, you've got different species, whether it's uh, in a uh, horse or a, a sheep or a, a, a dog. And along that line too, Scott, you mentioned to me about the fly uh, that uh, gets inside the grasshopper. That was kind of cool too. Yeah, that's uh, the, uh, like I said, there's actually, uh, there's three different families of flies that will utilize grasshoppers for their um, uh, larvae. And uh, the tachinids uh, are one of them. Um, and then nemestrenids and then sarcophagids uh, are, are ones. And probably everybody's probably seen tachinids uh, because they like to feed on uh, uh, flowers as adults. And so, the, and they're actually a, a pretty effective pollinator because they're hairy. Uh, let's see here. <clears throat> and again, they're, they're one, uh, there's a lot of them that. Uh, this is one that, that uh, a lot of people can see here in Wyoming. Let's see if they it up here. Uh, so uh, bright orange in it, and almost all of them are spiky. They have these really thick bristles on them. Some of them are not as spiky as this particular species, but this was one that's uh, pretty easy to spot in flowers. Uh, uh, that's what people may, mainly notice them. <clears throat> so again, they'll, they'll come up and lay an egg on uh, a insect. It's not necessarily always a grasshopper. Some of them are specialists, others are broad spectrum. And, and then that egg hatches and the larva is able to penetrate in between the hard segments of the insect. There's thin membrane and then they can get inside. And then many times that they will just feed on the blood of the insect and not really hurt it all that badly. Uh, you know, they're, they're a parasite. They're living at the expense of its host. And you generally don't kill it until they erupt through the insect to pupate in the ground. Is the way they do that. So Scott, I've got three questions here for you. One of them: Does Bacillus thuringiensis have activity of gra against grasshoppers? And do praying mantis eat grasshoppers? And thirdly. What about a sprinkling of flour on plants? Uh, well, uh, the commonly sold types of BT, the Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, which uh, Israelensis is one for mosquitoes, and then Christaki is one for, um, let's see, I think that's Lepidopteran, and Tenebrionis is one for uh, beetles. They're, uh, they've explored a lot of those and they have not uh, found or commercialized one for grasshoppers yet. Uh, but they're looking uh, because that would be a, a, another uh, tool in the toolbox. Uh, uh, praying mantises, uh, they're pretty broad spectrum uh, predators. And so as long as uh, they, you know, if it's within their size range at the stage that they're at, uh, yeah, they're going to take a grasshopper and no problem. 
Uh, so, you know, it's, it's one of those things, a baby praying mantis is not going to take on a full grown two striped grasshopper, but definitely. And then uh, I don't, uh, I've never heard about sprinkling, is that wheat flour on the leaves? Yeah, that's the only thing I'm seeing there is, is just a sprinkling of flour. So I'm going to assume that it's wheat flour. No, I, I, not that I know of, uh, you know, that I, I don't think that that would uh, bother them. You know, they're, they're one that really is, uh, I don't even know how successful diatomaceous earth would be in, in uh, bothering them. Um, so grasshoppers are pretty hardy once they get to be adults. They have a pretty thick exoskeleton. So I, I don't know. Uh, if you took one and took it in a bag and shook it up, uh, that would be a way to test it if, if it actually, uh, uh, maybe as a repellent effect is is, is uh, get some and, and treat your plant and, and turn them loose on it and see if they will go ahead and eat your, your plant with the flower dusting on it. So any other thoughts or questions about grasshoppers? I have learned a lot about grasshoppers tonight, Scott, so I appreciate that. You're welcome, Catherine. All right. Well, I guess that's all I had for you. I wanted to, like say, try to keep it uh, concise. And if you have any other uh, uh, pest problems or additional questions on grasshoppers, uh, you, you can certainly uh, contact me uh, anytime. So another question for you, does a rhubarb tea repel grasshoppers? So I don't know, is um, this is from Deb. Is that would you when you say rhubarb tea? Are you talking about the leaves themselves, or are you talking about the stalks? <laughs> yes to what? Because um, the, the leaves have got oxalic acid in them. Okay, so it's the leaves. So if you so Scott, if you made a tea out of the leaves uh, from a rhubarb plant. Is that going to help repel grasshoppers? Well, I, I have seen grasshoppers eat rhubarb leaves. And uh, I actually recently uh, uh, was going back and forth with Chris Hilbert about this. It turns out uh, when measured, uh, the oxalic acid in, in rhubarb leaves, uh, when they're green, uh, is not that high as compared to some other products or, or other plants. Uh, you now certain conditions can concentrate it. And, and what, I, what brought it up was uh, I'd harvested some rhubarb and I, of course I cut the leaves off and I put them uh, uh, just in a spot to try to smother some weeds that was near a fence. Uh, and, and my one stupid horse, uh, I was out doing something and he comes over and sees what are you up to? And he sees dried rhubarb leaves on the ground and decides to eat some. And he's like, oh no, they're poisonous. Uh, but he was eating them with obvious relish and no harm was done to him. And so I looked it up and it turns out uh, uh, the, the uh, at least in regular rhubarb leaves, uh, the oxalic acid is not uh, uh, that off the charts. And so uh, I kind of doubt it. And like I said, I, I actually have seen a grasshoppers chew on green rhubarb. So uh, they may not have eaten their fill. It may not be that tasty for them, but uh, uh, I, I, I don't know if it would do you any good. There are certainly uh, plants that, uh, in your yard when you've got a lot of grasshoppers that they will, um, the grasshoppers will avoid or eat only as last resort, like pine trees uh, and blue spruce. Generally, uh, they will get chewed on, uh, but it's, uh, I don't think it's high on their list of, of things. Uh, I, I actually had a call from a lady who writes for uh, uh, some uh, ag newspaper out of Montana. Montana has been having a really bad year with grasshoppers up there. And she talked to a guy who's a sheep rancher out near uh, Alveda, I think it is, or Alzada. Uh, and and uh, he had grasshoppers had ruined a a horse bridle that he had hung up. And he'd come back over to it and shift them off and they would, you know, I don't know what they were 
I guess they decided, well, it was better than nothing. And so they ate the leather on the horse bridle to the point where it was ruined. So <laughs> I think with grasshoppers, anything's food unless it kills them. <clears throat> So Scott, the que another question is, what other plants are high in oxalic acid? Uh, well, I don't, I don't know. I didn't uh, look up that. I just looked up, uh, you know, because I was initially when uh, the horse ate that that rhubarb plant, I said, "Oh my gosh, I've heard these are poisonous," and so I looked it up, and that's where I, I went to uh, what I thought was a fairly legitimate. Uh, site where they'd actually uh, you know, ran the uh, analyses on them, uh, but it, it didn't, it just compared them to other uh, garden plants. I think things like, uh, uh, I can't remember, it was turnips or beets, beet tops or something like that. And, and so that they weren't that toxic. It'd probably be pretty easy to Google it up and, and actually look at it. But again, uh, you know, it could be, it's, it's like forage plants. Uh, you can have certain conditions and you can get nitrate poison uh, uh, occur just from environmental conditions and the plant biochemistry can change. And, and so things that are, can be harvested for forage can turn toxic under certain conditions. And so certainly, uh, like say, you know, at first I thought, well, maybe it was because the leaves had dried out that they were uh, harmful to the horse and you know, he ate them with gusto. Uh, so I, I don't know, that's, uh, that's a good question. There's a book out there, Scott and Catherine, that um, I think it's called Poisonous Plants in North America and, there, and it breaks down by the different, excuse me, different bunch, but there's several of them that have the, the, that acid and the different ones. Yep. All right. Well, I guess if, if that's all the questions, uh, then uh, my my email address is uh, probably the easiest one to remember is my first initial and last name. It's S Shell at uwyo.edu, and uh, so you can always contact me with your insect questions or send me insect photos. I always like seeing the insect photos. Uh, so I might not be able to answer your question, but I can at least enjoy the photo and maybe forward it on to somebody who can. Well, again, Scott, I want to thank you for a great program and enlightening us on grasshoppers and helping us kind of cope with them a little bit better. And for everyone that joined us tonight, I want to thank you for your coming on and hope you all have a good evening. Scott, have a great evening. And again, thank you for taking time out. So good night, everybody. You're welcome. Bye.